You are listening to the Race to Racer podcast presented by Race 92. Race 92 is a vintage-inspired racing apparel brand specializing in celebrating vintage race culture and adapting to motorsports today. Check out race92.com for all your racing merchandise needs. I am your co-host, Aaron McAteer, other co-host. You may have seen walking out of Barber Lounge 459 with a big old smile on his face. He is Scott Bowie. Hey, what's going on, Aaron? Not a whole lot. Um, if you're watching, you'll also see we're joined by our good friend, Mr. Jagger Jones, um, we, we haven't talked, well, obviously we've talked to you, but not on the podcast, I think for several months. So a lot, really has a lot, a lot has happened since then, um, with really your career. And then, um, I guess personal, well, not personal life, but just, just with racing in general. Right. So, um, first off, let's talk a little, little about, um, I mean, you, you had a second place finish your career best so far in, um, Indy next at Detroit. Um, talk, talk a little bit about that weekend. Yeah, so we're seven races halfway through the Indy next season. And yeah, like you're talking to, definitely a highlight of the year for me at Detroit. Got a podium for a brand new team um, with Cape Motorsports this year, our first, my first year and the team's first year in Indy next. And we're competing a lot of, with a lot of good teams in Dreddy, HMD, IndyCar program, Dream Coast, another IndyCar program. So it's a really competitive series. And you've got uh, about 20 really good guys that are all trying and right on the cuffs of making it to IndyCar. So obviously see a lot of aggression because, you know, this is the, the opportunity to make it to where we all want to be. And so to get a podium in a second place when um, we have struggled here and there at some races and um, to get that finish was super good and a huge momentum boost for the team. And for me, um, I think a lot of people, you know, watched and saw that as well for a rookie driver and a, a rookie team. It was a really good result for me. And um, just a smooth race and a decent weekend there at Detroit. Unfortunately, that weekend I made a little bit mis- of a mistake in the second race uh, since we had a double header, but also had some good runs, had a ninth at Road America, had what was going to be a, a t- uh, seventh place finish, most likely a couple weeks ago at Mid-Ohio, but unfortunately ended with a little incident with a couple laps to go. Um, my opinion was pretty out of my control, so um, not hanging my head too high on that last finish, but we're headed into Iowa this weekend, our first oval of the year. So that's going to be super exciting. Uh, we went and tested there and it, it went pretty well. So we'll see what we can kind of made a lot of adjustments though from the test. So we're going to see hopefully first oval for the team and for me in these cars. So it's a lot different than the NASCAR oval stuff that I did uh, back in the day. But, you know, there's still some uh, minor, minor things that I can kind of take and I've ran on ovals before uh, a good bit. So hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll carry some confidence into this weekend coming up at Iowa. Yeah, I tell you, it's, it's been interesting to watch the progression of you and the team. Uh, uh, St. Pete was a, unfortunately didn't get very far. And, and then just uh, Barber had a good race, uh, was going to be a good finish. Unfortunate mechanical issue on a restart um you know after a red flag uh restarting the car um and just you know it's going to be ups and downs and that's how it is for rookie teams and rookie drivers um what's kind of some of the takeaways you you can that you have so far i mean coming from you know the basically the the beginning of road dandy skipping that step and now you're in, in what is essentially, I mean, the closest thing to an Indy car you're going to get into right now. Um, what what have you kind of taken away from with that? Yeah, I've definitely progressed as a driver and learned a lot just in general this year. I think the first thing that kind of jumps into the in my head is obviously the speed transition from USF 2000, you know, about 200 something horsepower. And um, it's all about momentum. But then you get into this Indy next car and. Uh, some tracks like Road America, we're going 15, 18 seconds quicker a lap. So it's huge difference and so much more downforce too. I think that's been a huge key and a little bit of a learning curve for me and the team is how do we get the downforce right? How do we get the car low to the ground? How do we maximize and create the most downforce out of the car? So that's kind of a, a huge focus for us right now and just throughout this whole year. And I still think we're progressing on that side of things. And it, it wasn't something where the team uh, with all their years and USF 2000 and the lower series that they had didn't have to worry about nearly as much as now. And me as a driver, I haven't raced 
a car with even close to the how much downforce are in the Indy next car. So kind of figuring out that side of things. Um, and I think our biggest struggle has kind of been on the qualifying pace. And I think some of it kind of alludes to that. So we're, we're still working and making gains in that direction, but our race pace has been really good. You know, some, some races we kind of qualified towards the back and, um, if I can make it through the, the first couple laps and the mess there is at the back, uh, or mid pack, then usually the race and the speed kind of comes to us, um, throughout the weekend. So, um, it's been tricky, but I think I've learned so much being with this new team in Cape Motorsports of how to, you know, kind of create and create a setup and a baseline setup and helping the team with the direction and learning so much about the shocks and um, aero stuff and all the different stuff we can do, um, which for me has been cool because I've been able to progress as a driver in that way a lot more than I think if I would have just hopped in an Intrady or HMD car that's already fast. And I just kind of got to worry about minor setup things to fit my driving style. But in this program this year, I've learned so much about how to kind of create a setup from baseline basically. So it's, it's been cool in that fashion and also just a lot of attrition this year in our series. So being smart and how to be aggressive, but also smart and kind of put myself in smart positions. And obviously there's been some incidents that happen more likely when you're in the mid pack and you're kind of in the dog fight a bit really. So um, just kind of working through that. And I think I've, my race craft, race craft has been a lot better because I kind of have to rely on that more than just pure speed, um, which I know I've kind of was more in that position last year where we had the speed and I just had to be more smart. But this year I kind of have to, you know, fight it wheels, elbows up and uh, make the most of what I, what I do have in these races. Absolutely. So <clears throat> also we got to talk about on, Indy, on the on race day indy 500 you got to drive your grandfather's 1963 um indy 500 winning um old calhoun car now you've driven a replica before a gateway a couple years ago and i know that was pretty special for you but this was the car on the track so talk a little bit about that experience and kind of what it was like driving it and what kind of what that means to you yeah, it was it was a surreal experience. First, I, I want to thank uh, Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum for allowing me to do that, and for my uh, grandpa's approval as well to let me uh, drive his car and trust me with it. So it it was just awesome. I mean, it's hard to put in words how much that meant for me and just kind of the history in general. It was so cool. Yeah, it would also you say the track Indianapolis Motor Speedway and the car but also the morning before the Indy 500, the energy was electric, um, so many fans, and I got so much attention from that, which was cool, um, kind of in a less stressful situation as a race weekend and kind of just get to enjoy the history of our of our great sport and IndyCar and the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and Indy 500. So it, it was it's hard to put into words, but to me it meant so much, and it wasn't even something that I, I really ever thought that I'd be able to do. And um, when the opportunity presented itself, I was like, it really kind of hit. And I was like, wow, like this is going to be awesome if I can make this happen. And luckily we were able to, and it was cool too, to be out there with um, guys like Rick Mears and Mario and Dreddy were also driving vintage cars that day and um, some other big names. So it was just cool to be a part of that and kind of be in that name and in that group that got to do that that day. I, I didn't see it uh, when I went down and looked at the car beforehand. I didn't see you, but um, I did see later on where like Rico Abreu, he'd come to the 500 and he went down there to look at the car. And I, I don't know if he, you were there when he was there or not, but uh, I know there's something about that race car that attracts a lot of people. And I, I it really is a, I mean, it really does. It, it is something about the look of it. And uh, I don't, I mean, Parnelli, Parnelli's, legend has has lasted so many decades um but what i think is really interesting is like you, you got to wear like a replica helmet but you got to roll around and you, you know you get to kind of get an idea of what he was going through race day um and it's also you kind of also got a feel for what it's going to be like on your first race day like rolling around you know looking at all the the crowd looking at the amount of people what i mean just did that hit home as you were doing it did it hit home later um you know how did that feel i mean just 
Um, yeah, I think it was cool to be able to do that in a obviously much less stressful environment because, you know, not competing, not racing, but yeah, I think you do. I did get a sense of how big this race is. And obviously I've known that growing up at the Indy 500, my whole life basically, but, um, to be able to kind of be a part of the show in a way was really cool and, um, see all the fans and you, um, I've driven around there in some pace car rides and stuff, but never in a race car. And then, um, you know, usually on off days where the stands are empty, but it's a whole different track when you see all the fans sitting in the seat, in the seats, it's, it seems so much smaller. It seems almost like you're in like a stadium, um, yeah. in a sense that day when you're rolling around there and, um, it would, for how big of a place is too. usually at racetracks, you don't get too much of that feel on these bigger tracks, but it, it really was surreal to see all the fans and, um, you hear, you know, these huge numbers of 300,000 plus people there, but when you roll around the track and get to see all of them in a, couple minutes span it really changes your perspective on the the whole event and yeah i mean it was super cool and as you were saying how i think that car has drawn so much attention i think my grandpa in general just um was a real badass for his day and yeah you see on paper he had one indy 500 win but i, I think um a lot of people understand and know that um he was really deserved more than that and also his legacy beyond just his driving at the indy 500 with all the sprint car wins and AHA 1000 Trans Am wins, uh, his wins as a team owner. I think he had a, a really big role in the sports of motorsports in general, not just IndyCar. And I think that's, in my opinion, one of the things that's really attracted um, his fame and kept his legacy going on for so long. Yeah, you know, I, I say this uh, all the time. Uh, there are just some people that are the center of, everything and what i mean by that is you can always trace things back to them like they're the connectors of the you know whether it's rick mears or uh you know kevin kogan or, or whoever man i mean there's just tons and tons and tons of guys you know you listen to them talking well but you know parnelli was a big part of my you know you know this is bobby Unser. i mean parnelli brought basically brought bobby to the speedway and and you know, hooked him up with, uh, you know, the teams he drove for and that. And he just, I mean, it's amazing. It, it, it just, it's amazing the impact he had on the sport and what was really a very short driving career. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in his career, he had, I mean, he led over, uh, like 400 and some laps. Um, yeah, I forget the exact number, maybe a little more, but, you know, his, his, percentage of laps led is just unbelievable uh, and he had a chance to win all but maybe one of them that he ran in i mean he was in position i mean it's just unbelievable then he like you said he took it and did it in stock cars and he did it in trans am cars and he did it in um everything he ever set foot in and with his partner bell i mean they created an amazing racing team that went from here to Europe and all over the world. And it's just, man, he just has such an impact in this sport. Uh, and I think it, and I think it just resonates for, I, I just, for whatever reason, his name is one of those names that just resonates, not much unlike Roger Penske or, or Andretti or, you know, I mean, it's just, it's a name that people recognize and, and um, they know that excellence. Mm -hmm. You know, and you yeah, talk I about, agreed. Sorry, go ahead, Jagger. I was just gonna say about yeah. It's also it wasn't like um, he he had a really short career, at least at the Indy 500 and Indy cars. He right. you know kind of got out of racing and wanted to start the family and um, not put himself in the you know the danger of the cars at that time. And that's another thing too, like you said, the percentage of races and he had a chance to win almost every 500 he was in. And, um, not many people can say that, which is, um, I mean, I know he's talking about the, the ones that kind of slipped away with some unlucky, unfortunate things, but it was really impressive when you kind of go back and look at all the races and um, those eight or nine years of, of the 500 he did and kind of he was the guy to beat almost every year. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. It's just, and just to be able to share, share that, I mean, they're like, 
Yeah, I just I, I just think that's amazing that that you got to take take part in that. And um, man, it's just man rare opportunities in life, and you just got to take advantage of when they come, right? Yeah, absolutely. I I knew since it was kind of the perfect timing, and um, you know, hopefully, I won't be able to do stuff like that in the next couple of years, right? Uh, or two years or so from now, because hopefully, I'll be in the show. So it was cool to you know, have that opportunity to, to do that now. Right. So obviously you didn't really get to get the car up to speed, but I mean, you, you got to drive it. Like what, what did, was your overall impression of the car and kind of how it handled? Um, first thing is kind of just how you really notice how much our sports progress and you really have a respect for that day of motors, that age of motorsports, um, with just seeing how much the cars have changed safety wise, uh, literally everything from that, from that day. And you really, really realize it when you're sitting in those, those old, uh, indie cars and yeah, the car, I mean, your head, another thing too, which you realize is your head and your body so exposed, especially me being mm -hmm. a little taller. And, um, it was just, I don't want to say the word ancient because, um, it, it's so cool. And that, that form of motorsports. Um, so awesome, but very dangerous. And um, obviously, there still has the danger and the high speeds these days. But um, going 150 mi over 150 miles an hour in that car would be absolutely insane. Yeah, I, I, it was a, a parade and a show. So didn't want to, you know, be a negative part of history for that car. So <laughs> just wanted to um, just kind of enjoy the moment and um, enjoy the experience in general. But uh, just you know, everything from the clutch to the um, drive shaft being right there and how how, how much of the car is um, exposed to you as a driver is um, kind of gives me a whole nother, um, whole, so much more respect for what those guys were able to do in those cars back in the day. Well, yeah, I, I just can't imagine running that thing an average lap of 150, 155 mile an hour. I don't even know what yeah. the fastest one ran. I, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, I mean, the fastest one ran faster than that, but, uh, Jesus, man. I mean, that, that is, that is some, crazy. Uh, that is some crazy stuff. I mean, but you know, it wasn't crazy for the time. That was, no. that was, I know. That's, that, that's, that's the most cool. advanced. Yeah. Yeah, what I was thinking is, you know, 40, 50 years from now, we'll look at Scott Dixon's Indy 500 winning yeah. car, you know, the car that wins in this era, and they'll be looking at how did those guys race these? They were so dangerous, and um, they were going 240-something in, in these cars. It'll be crazy to look back and think um, in so many years from now and kind of the same way we're looking at it now. But, um, yeah, and then I can't even, can't even imagine – you know, what the future of our, our sports hold, but it's cool to be able to go back and kind of, that's the one thing I, I really do appreciate about the Indy 500 is how much history they still, uh, or how much importance they show to the history of the event yeah. in IndyCar. And I think it's, um, you don't see that as much in other sports. And I think that's one thing IndyCar does really well. I, I agree that that is, um, we can, we can get on about marketing and all that mm -hmm. stuff, but I mean, as far as reverence for its history, mm -hmm. they they do a good job with that for sure. Yeah, for um, sure. Um, so this is our um, intro for our McGillivray show that we did a couple weeks ago with um, Kyle Kaiser and Lockie Hughes. And we always do like a little bit of a recap of recent races. So obviously we have the Toronto IndyCar race today. Chris and Lungard got his first one, finally got to shave that mustache. And um, I, I think that I think you, that's what you need to do, Jagger. Like grow a mustache and not shave it till you win. How many? I, how many? I, how uh, many months would it take you to grow a mustache? <laughs> um, love it. I, I don't even know if you would. I don't know if the word months would be in the equation. I think we might have to go to years. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm still working on that that part of things. But uh, maybe. If I had to do a bet like that, it, had, it might have to be my hair. I got plenty of hair on my head, but the facial hair is um, kind of lacking right now. So maybe um, by the time I'm in IndyCar, maybe that can be in, in the play. 
But as of right now, I'll stick to uh, not that, something else. I don't know. <laughs> well, we kind of discussed it before we come on, but what was your overall impression of the race today? Uh, I thought it was a great race. It, it was cool to find, you know, we're usually racing on IndyCar weekend, so I see here and there, and I try to, you know, watch qualifying and see kind of how the track's progressing um, the night before the race, just to kind of have an idea. But I don't really get to sit down and, you know, watch a whole IndyCar week. And I watched some of practice. I watched qualifying. I watched the race on TV. And um, you can see, almost see more than when you're at the racetrack, especially for me, yeah. you know, I'm busy on my side of things. So I don't really get to <laughs> be, get to really watch and get a full understanding of, you know, kind of what's going on with the IndyCar side of things. So it was cool to be able to watch the Toronto race today. Um, I think it's a, a great track. I, I really liked racing there last year. It was unfortunate we didn't get to go this year. Um, our series didn't, wasn't on the schedule, but um, I thought first thing that jumped out of me was Polo. That was a, a pretty impressive drive. I think if it wasn't for that wing damage, he probably could have had more of a fight with Lungard. I, I mean, Lungard was really quick, but um, there's they got the strategy just right. And um, I think without that wing damage, we could have had a, a race for the win with Polo, who qualified 15th or 16th or or something, you know, back in there pretty far back, which was impressive. I think um, it kind of showed that I don't think anyone's beaten him this year in the championship unless, you know, something crazy happens, Um, which, I mean, I don't think it's always a bad thing. You know, you're going to have years where the championship fight isn't super close, but every race this year has been so entertaining from a fan perspective today. That was an awesome race. I was didn't go on my phone or anything. I was sitting there watching the whole race entertained. Um, a lot of passing, a lot of great action at a street track like Toronto, which um, could be a, a trickier uh, tr- track to pass. And um, it was cool. I, it was cool seeing Dixon kind of make a run after their little misfortune with strategy back up to the to fourth. Um, all in all, I mean, it was a pretty fun race to watch. I think it's crazy when you watch in how close they cut it on strategy. Harder runs out of fuel right after. Um, Newgarden runs out of fuel right after. Erickson runs out of fuel right before mm-hmm. the end. As Power well as well. Power. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just amazing. Uh, you know, I mean, it really is just, I mean, moments of fuel going into the tank uh, between finishing and not finishing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It seemed like for whatever reason, some of them had their numbers wrong because at least power was saying after the race, he said he probably could have saved more. Or maybe he made a mistake or, or it was new garden saying that the numbers might've been off, which you don't usually see too often, but um, yeah, because there wasn't, it didn't sound like there was too much fuel concern up until people started running out. Right. So they're, they're, they might've been a little uh, ambitious on, on that side of things. But I mean, moon guard, even with, you know, having to restart seventh or so made his way back up up there it was i mean cool to see another team kind of jump into the mix when um ray hall seemed they've had pace here and there but never really as much race pace as it seemed they needed to win a race um and obviously didn't don't have the pace at a, a lot of places so it was kind of a, a little bit of, of a shocker i didn't expect that because I mean, yeah he got the pull but it was mixed conditions with the rains uh the rain and the track drying so i, I thought you know i thought more of the andretti's were going to kind of make their way to the front they seem to be the quickest but in my opinion, I think it seems where they struggle is the race pace. And you see teams like Ganassi and Penske just have so much less degradation on tires versus like Andretti or Ray Hall or some of those other teams, whatever they're doing to save the tires, because even if they don't qualify well, somehow they're right up there at the front, especially towards the end of the stints. And I know that people talk about how good the Penske cars are and the old tires. And um, I mean, it was cool to see one a different team kind of figure it out and get a win yeah i i agree i loon a very deserving try i i i i think he's i think that guy's got a lot of talent yeah um, yeah i agree I mean, yeah, right Lungard, yeah he's, <clears throat> he's young too i i remember i raced against him a little bit back in the karting <laughs> days he's you know a year or so older than me um and he would he would come over and race super nats or some of the, the big kart races in the u.s and um, he was always um, fast, and it was, I mean, cool to see. I mean, yeah, last year he had some really good runs, but it seems like this year he's 
definitely figured it out more. And I'm su- I was always, even after last year, I was surprised a team like Ganassi or someone didn't um, jump on, on Loon Guard and try to get them over to their side of things. But I mean, I, I think he's in a pretty good contract and it seems like the Ray Hall team is kind of trending the right, right way um, with some of these at some of the races, but they don't, I don't think they have everything figured out just yet, but I mean, they're definitely going in the right direction, which will be cool to see another team yeah. more in the mix. Yeah. I mean, if they can, if they can get that race that, you know, get their bar raised up, I mean, that's going to be a hell of a fight every week. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I mean, because it'll be a hell of a fight between four teams mm-hmm. who could, who they could all could win it. You know, unfortunately, coin right now just seems a little off. Um, yeah. You know, for whatever reason. Um, but other than that, man, I mean, that, that series is unbelievable. It is. I mean, you don't really see and too many other race series in the world where you have so many guys that can could win a race like there's 10 12 guys where if they won today i wouldn't have been it wouldn't have been a a crazy win um so i mean it's it's cool to see and um yeah i think like you're saying coin they yeah seem to struggle which is kind of surprising because um they were really fast i remember malukas i think it was last year where finished second at a gateway and was up front at a lot of these tracks and it seems like not too much rules wise has have changed from last year. So it's interesting to see a team go backwards like that. But um I mean it seems like you know people kind of go up and down and Honda and Chevy kind of back and forth a little bit. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if you see them kind of turn things around eventually, maybe not till next year. But uh, right. yeah, that's the thing with IndyCar too is it's not change can happen so quick. Like we're talking about with Ray Hall, you know, they were Miss the Indy, miss the Indy 500 with the car, and um, a couple months later they're winning races and stuff. So it's that's another thing that I think is really cool is it doesn't take so long as you see in like Formula One. It could take you know years to rebuild a team, and in any car, if you have the right people and um, kind of seem to focus on the right things, then change can really happen race to race, yeah. which is I think always cool from a, a driver's perspective because you know you're not completely out of it at all times right absolutely well i don't do you have anything else to add scott before no i was just gonna say uh uh this talk we had with Lockie and uh kyle was great really they they really play off each other well they're they're good friends uh Lockie, unfortunately has had a really bad run of races since being on the show he was the points leader when he was on the show uh and since then he's been involved in some crashes and got upside down at mid Ohio, unfortunately. Um, but I, I really like the guy and I, I really think he's got a lot of talent. And, mm-hmm. uh, I just hope that, you know, here in the last few weeks of the season, he can get it turned around and, and things keep, you know, start going back to right direction. Yeah, definitely. Lockie is another kid who I raced against in Europe and the U S and carding stuff and definitely always been really fast and really talented. So, um, it's cool to see, you know, him having success and, you know, the people I used to race against and were friends with growing up are doing well in all these different series. Right. Well, Jagger Jones, thank you so much for always joining us. And um, like I said, it's been a while, but it's good good to have you back on the show. And I know you're a, a busy man doing Jagger Jones things. So um, <laughs> working out and doing Murphs and um, – Eating. Hey, speaking of which, put a put a plug in for your merch. Yeah, yeah. go by. I'm I'm <laughs> running out of some sizes, and uh, I got two new mer- two shirts for st- for sale still. So yeah, go buy some merch. One of them's kind of a, a retro uh, Parnelli Jones that kind of plays into my uh, livery and stuff this year. So yeah, go go check those out. JaggerJonesRacing.com. Well, thanks everyone for listening and uh, make sure you like and subscribe and everyone have a great week. Take care, bye. All right, so this is the Race to Racer podcast presented by Race 92, live at McGilvery's Pub and Eatery. I'm your co-host, Aaron Mack, to other co-hosts you may have seen walking out of Barber Lounge 459. Not big, anytime soon, you haven't. With a big old smile on his face, he is Scott Bowie. Hey, everybody, how you doing? Come on. Come on. <laughs> That's right. That's what I want to hear.
So obviously we're a racing podcast. We can be found on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Make sure you like and subscribe. Special thanks to McGilvery's, obviously, for letting us do this. Please make sure you buy food, buy drinks, and tip well. <laughs> Absolutely. Some of our other sponsors, thanks to Grand King Race Shops um, for sponsoring this, helping us put it together. And I will also mention Race 92. You can buy Grand King Racers um, shirts as well as other shirts, including Allen's or Jr. on Race92.com. Also, Racer Collect. Patrick wasn't able to be with us today, but he's been a big supporter of us, always comes to the shows. So if you're looking for any racing memorabilia, go to racercollect.com. Also, Fast Times Indoor Karting. We'll get into that in a second, but uh, <laughs> thanks to Fast Times. We do a little um, video series here called Pro vs. Joe's. You can check that out on our YouTube um, channel. And last sponsor, Scott. Good folks and good guys. Heating and air. If you have problems, call them up. They'll take care of you. Absolutely. So we have two special guests today. First off to my right is a two-time Indianapolis 500 starter. He's a 2017 Indy Lights champion, um, Kyle Kaiser. Thanks for having me. And can't forget Lockie. He's currently driving in um, USF 2000 with J. Howard Motorsports, currently leading the championship. Four wins, right? Four wins this year? Four wins, yeah. Yeah. Lockie Hughes. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you guys so much for coming out. And um, so <laughs> our last show was with Stingray Rob, and we were joking about Fast Times, about first time you did our Fast Times video, the little, um, I don't know what you want to call it. Scott was there. Yeah. Yeah, I was there. Yeah. So we kind of talked about it the last time, but when Kyle was leaving, he saw a um, <laughs> oh man, a, a naked guy. Um, yeah, I, I can down. tell that story. I feel like I've told it a hundred times now. Yeah. It was pretty bizarre. I mean, for those who haven't heard it, um, it, we did our shoot, and it was it was it was a really fun time. It was pretty slippery on the track, so that was a little interesting. But leaving the place, we I left at like eight o'clock and chatted to them for a while. And as I'm driving away. I drove right past a guy who had just been shooting people butt naked out in front of, not really in front of fast times, but kind of around the corner by the dealerships, was six inches from my window as I drove past right after he'd tossed his gun. So crazy situation, unforgettable moment. I don't know if I should say what I was about to say. Tiny dong. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll put that on the record. But yeah, it was, uh, it was unforgettable. I'll just say that. <laughs> Maybe that's why you're shooting. <laughs> yeah, shooting probably, people. but yeah, very interesting situation there. But uh, I definitely won't forget that one. Fortunately, I don't. I think you know one person may have got injured, but no one I don't think got seriously injured. So that's fortunate. Kyle uh, was mentally injured. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kyle may have to go to some kind of counseling after that deal. But yeah, fortunately, nobody, uh, <laughs> nobody was. Yeah, one person went to the hospital and recovered. So. Don't want to joke about those situations because it's not funny. But at the end of the day, knowing everybody's okay, right. that's that's always good. But very, very strange situation leaving there. And of the eight years I've lived here, never seen anything like that. Just takes you yeah. doing our um, video, Racer Racer podcast, and that happens. I came back for a second time. So and I'll, I'll always, give, always give you a hard time. And the last time you, you, you gave me the all clear, I said, next time you just got to send me a text, say, hey, man, there's, a, <laughs> there's a naked guy walking towards Fast Times. Yeah, I, I, if that happens again, I'll give you the heads up. That's for sure. I think it's just when Scott shows up at these places, kind of crazy stuff. Man, happens. crazy stuff happens anytime I'm around. It's it's a, because there was ex right when you walked in, there was an explosion. Yeah, there was an explosion on the interstate right as I walked in. Then that, and then uh, numerous numerous things. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so we had to, like I said, um, lock in Locky. Unfortunately, you weren't there for the first one. Fortunately, you, you missed you missed a lot, or as Kyle said, maybe yeah. you didn't miss much at all. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was good to not witness that. So obviously, you're having a very good year, Lockie. Um, first off, like how how did you guys really? Because you're kind of like a mentor, Lockie, right, Kyle? Like how did you guys like really meet? <laughs> I'll let Lockie answer that question. But well, actually, when I first moved to the U.S. last year, I started living with uh, Spencer Piggott. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kyle and Spencer are good friends, so um, naturally just 
from hanging out with Spencer and living with Spencer. I got to know Kyle, unfortunately. And um, yeah, here we are. <laughs> He's constantly leaning on me for advice on how to be faster. So I'll gracefully give him any, <laughs> any tips and feedback before his race weekends. But all, all jokes aside, I can't really take any credit for Lockie's success. He's a very talented young driver. Um, and I was friends with him before knowing he was good, so I guess I can throw that out there. I just thought he was a fun guy to hang out with, and fortunately, he's also very talented, so it's fun to watch him race, and if you haven't watched him, I, I would recommend keeping an eye on him because I think he's very talented and has all the skill to make it to the top, so I'm, I'm rooting for him, which keeps me kind of involved and invested with watching the road to Indy nowadays. Well, we'll say I think he's technically our fastest pro racer now at Fast Times, oh, besides yeah. Jackson and um, Trey, but they work there. So they've done a little bit more laps than you. All right. But I, we, I did a little bit of investigation last time it was at Fast Times because I wondered how many times you'd been to Fast Times, and it was less than 10. So it's pretty impressive. Okay. Yeah. The, yeah, I, um, I, don't even, I, I only just started going there with Kyle. So um, show, him, show him the way. So. You even do nice. Quick. He even does nice waves when he goes by people. I do. I do. Sometimes yeah. the one finger wave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when we were there together, and uh, what was that, ahead of you or behind you when you were? Give probably, me the bird. probably behind. Probably behind. So he's he's just flipping me off the whole time. Which he he's a he's a colorful character. That's the Australian in him, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. So um, for you, Kyle, like, how old were you when you first got interested in racing? Like, how did that happen? Yeah, so I, I'd say I first got interested in racing when I was five or six years old. I used to go to Laguna Seca. Grew up in California, so I was going out there to watch my dad race in SCCA. He would take his Mustang out that he'd built and was excited to get on tr racing tracks. And so I was just a little kid supporting my dad. And, of course, I thought it was super cool as a five-year-old sitting up on the corkscrew watching him drive around Laguna. And, you know, one thing leads to another. And he's like, would you like to try go-kart racing? And, of course, I was all about it. So we were going to our local kart tracks and getting behind a kid kart at six years old. And you just kind of progress as you get faster. You want to start winning. You get involved with some different race teams. Next thing you know, you're 13, jumping in a Skip Barber car, and then you're racing IndyCar at 19 years old. So that, that's kind of the path that a lot of different drivers in IndyCar followed. So very, very fortunate that I was able to work my way up uh, over the years. You know, um, I mean, you've had a lot of success in the Formula Series, that, you know, especially the Road Indy. Um, most people are here are going to know you from – knocking the Lonzo out, making the 500. Was that um, – what was that moment like? I mean, was it – you know, was it one of those things where – I mean, was that like the best moment or was it – was you always expected like that was going to be the outcome that day or, or how did that go for you? Yeah, I'd, I'd say over the course of my career, I don't think there's a moment that overshadows that. I think – there's no question about it. The, the high stakes, making the 500, where the other option was to just not be in the race at all. I don't think anything, even winning the Indy, Indy Lights Championship doesn't really compare to being able to make the 500. So I'd say, yeah, without a question, that's probably the biggest moment in my racing career. In terms of, you know, what that event was like, what that day, the days leading up to it were like, and then that moment, um, I, I did not think, although I did everything I could, I didn't think we were going to make the race. Realistically, if you'd asked me right before that, you know, do you think you're going to pull it off? I sure hope so. <laughs> but realistically, what are the odds of that happening? Slim at best. So I think that's what made that moment even more special is that nobody really would have put their money on us to make the race at that point. It would have been a great underdog story, and it was a great underdog story. But I don't think going into it, we were thinking that, yeah, we're going we're gonna to get in there pretty safe. You know, um, this year we were watching qualifying, and I was standing there with someone – and we were watching Harvey, who eventually obviously knocked Ray Hall out. And the person I was standing there with commented, like, I don't understand why they're so happy because they're so slow. They're in the back. I mean, but realistically, that was you. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what, what does that moment mean, you know, that that person didn't understand? Yeah, it's – and I kind of had that conflicted moment. I, maybe not in the moment because the difference was be in the race or not be in the race. Right. It wasn't – be slow or be slower, <laughs> right. right? When you're thinking about that, it's like, yeah, what's the big deal? But if you're saying I get to be in the greatest race in the entire world or sit on the sidelines, that that is the contrast, not right. I'm, I'm starting dead last. And that was kind of what I started joking about shortly after is I've never been so excited to be last place in my entire <laughs> life 
there's no other race in the world where you're so pumped to be 33rd out of 33. But that's that's kind of the allure and what makes that race so special is just being in it is a big deal. And I think there's reasons why we were last in that in that situation, crashing and rebuilding a car. I don't think had had we not crashed on Fast Friday, I think we would have been potentially fighting for the Fast Nine. Oh. So we our car was so fast, and that's why we were pushing to run the car so low on Fast Friday. We wanted to put up a stunner time, which we we bit the bullet on that and had to <laughs> had to you know rebuild the car and totally fight for our lives just to make it. But at the end of the day, when it came down to it, making the race was worth more than anything. I would have traded anything to be in that race. So. Glad I didn't have to trade everything to be in the race, but yeah, it was it was an awesome feeling. Right. And so, I mean, the year before was your first 500. Like, you know, talking about just barely getting in, like, do you think the second almost means more to you just because there was more, like, blood, sweat, tears into it because of everything that happened throughout the month? They're both very different experiences. I mean, the first year, qualifying was a breeze. <laughs> we went out one time, threw it 17th. First, the first time, you know, um, doing it for me is – and I – I can't say first time for Hunkos, but first time with the newer car. So I guess that's almost like a first time. So it was a great performance, and it went smoother. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we had a mechanical in that race. So I feel like we could have had actually a decent result in that one and just didn't get to finish. So I'll never forget the first time going out, but I'd say the second one's bigger, I think, just because of all the drama and all the things that we went through emotionally. So if I had to look back on it, I definitely remember the second one more than the first. Absolutely. Now, Lockie. 2017, 2018, were you following, or no, that would have been, two, yeah, 2018, 2019, and I guess you were born then, <laughs> <laughs> but were you following IndyCar racing at all back then? Yeah, I remember growing up watching um, a lot of, like, back in, like, the early 2010s, watching, I'd been following IndyCar back from mm -hmm. when it was Frank Heaty and Dixon and Power all going at it, um, so always followed IndyCar, because IndyCar used to come, so I'm from the Gold Coast, Surface Paradise. So that's where IndyCar used to come to when they used to race in Australia. Um, so I guess I know sort of like the home of IndyCar of Australia there. Um, so I always loved IndyCar and remember watching Kyle knock out Fernando um, at the Indy 500 and thinking, who, who the hell's that guy? <laughs> 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 and uh, here we are now. But um, no, I think it's it's the best racing in the world, really, uh, mm -hmm. IndyCar. Um, and biggest race in the world, the Indy 500. So, uh, yeah, it's awesome. Who who were some of your, like, racing, I guess, idols growing up? I mean, would, would it be, like, Will Power? Uh, well, Kyle, obviously. Yeah. Well, Kyle, yeah. After <laughs> me, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, to, to be honest, not even Will Power. I mean, growing up, it was more like Mark Webber, Daniel sure. Ricciardo, um, Anson Senna, these sort of uh, drivers. But um, just... Yeah, I think when you're such a young kid, it's like Formula One's a big thing you look at. You're like got stars in your eyes, and all you can think of is Formula One. Um, but then you sort of grow up, and you sort of like see a bit more for what racing is and everything. And then I started to gain a lot more respect, um, or gain uh, like yeah, just wanted to race IndyCar. So um, yeah, I mean, Will Power, I mean. Being an Aussie, you, you always love him, but it's, he, they're just not as famous back home as, say, Ricardo and Weber. So they're not. You don't really um, learn about him as quickly, right? That. Uh, so I mean, what was your journey to America like? I mean, how did you get her? By plane. Well, <laughs> I mean, that's a good way to do it. It's better than swimming. I'll tell you that. Yeah. No. It's. Uh, I mean, I. Used to race go karts. Uh, obviously, started growing up racing go karts in Australia, um, and I did a lot of racing actually in the US. Used to come over, uh, do a lot of races over here. Used to go to Europe a lot, um, wherever you could get drives really. Um, and then made the natural progression to cars back home in Australia for a few years, and then COVID hit and all that. And the goal was always to get to the US, but. It was just about finding the budget to be able to get here. Um, and then as soon as we found that, last, which was last year, we came over, won the F4 championship, and then, uh, yeah, racing uh, USF 2000 this year. Uh, winning the championship, and, yeah, plan is just to keep winning and winning and <laughs> go to IndyCar. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Just keep winning right up until you're starting the 500, right? Exactly. And then try to win again. Exactly. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a hard road. I mean... 
uh, I've watched somebody on the road indie uh, for the last couple of years, and, and um, it's not easy. And, uh, like, you know, winning four races is a big effing deal. I mean, in that series, spec race cars, that is some hard, hard racing. We're just halfway done, right? Season's yeah. about halfway done? And, uh, yeah, just over halfway. And, I mean, and Jay Hired's team has great equipment. They weren't great last year. So, I mean, it's not like you were stepping into what you thought might be the race-winning deal, you know? Yeah. Um, kind of kind of walk us through that path of, you know, that exploration of finding the right team in the right situation and, and that when you, you know, when you're spending your own money, yeah, you know, you, you know, whether it's your money or money that you raised, um, uh, what's that like? Well, I actually, um, one of the go-kart races I came over and did in the U S I, uh, I raced for Jay Howard cause he had a go-kart team. Um, so I always, I developed a good relationship with Jay then. Um, and I knew when I come over to the U S and go to cars, I want to race for Jay. Um, so obviously he's out of the teams in the road to Indy um, or USF Pro Championships as it's known now. Right. Um, he's obviously raced IndyCar, so he knows people in the paddock and stuff, which helps for introducing you to people and uh, all that. Um, but no, I, I, I honestly never really spoke to any other team in the field apart from Jay. Um, I just knew... I knew what he could do. I knew he's, he's the best, very good driver coach, um, which is very important at this stage of your career to have someone, you know, who's done it before and can give you the advice um, that a lot of other team owners can't. So Right. I, I felt like Jay's really taken a bad rap for that crash with Dixon to the, where it's kind of, you know, in, in certain people's eyes, it's hurt his reputation a little bit. And it, it's a racing deal. I mean, I don't I don't know why that – I don't know if it's because the crash was so spectacular or, you know, there's always these weird moments where there's this weird perception that just isn't really accurate. And it's good to see, you know, his, like I, I watched Jay Howard's deal last year. And I mean, they have beautifully prepared cars and everything's first class and it's just, they were struggling. And it's nice to see that you've walked in there, you know, really helped the team go forward and obviously, you're able to use resources that are available to you that maybe the other drivers couldn't. Yeah. You yeah. Know. I, yeah. I really know what to say, but um, <laughs> yeah, I just get in and drive as fast as I can. So it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what I mean, it is. Really. I mean, it really isn't. I mean, that's really what it is at the end of the day, right? You yeah. can break it down how many different ways, but you got to go fast. Yeah, I'd say one thing, just looking back at the time I spent in the road to Indy, for the most part, a lot of the teams are going to be pretty even. These yeah. cars, there's only so much you can do to these USF 2000 cars and whatever they're calling them nowadays. Pro Mazda yeah. back when I was racing them and Indy Lights cars. If the top teams, you know, you look now there's so many of the same teams running a lot of the cars. But when I was racing, you could pick any of the top four or five teams. And if you're the most talented driver, you're probably going to be up there. Right. So I think that's what's good about the series is that talent does kind of rise to the top and show these Indy car programs who, who has the talent to make it. Right, I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. yeah. So for you, Lockie, um, so obviously you race in Australia. Did you race over in Europe at all? Yeah, so uh, not in cars, but go karts. So I used to yeah. race in Europe quite a bit. Um, like, so a lot of the a lot of the guys who are on the F two grid now, F three grid, a couple of the F one guys, I used to race in carts. So um, you'll, yeah, just they're fortunate enough to be born with parents that have a little bit more money that. And that's uh, the biggest thing in racing. Um, Got to be able to pay for it somehow, whether it's sponsors or family money. Um, yeah, a lot of those guys in Europe, it's a completely different world. I mean, yeah. you're talking billionaires. So it's, uh, yeah, it's different. <laughs> well, you know, the crazy thing is like with IndyCar racing, if you look the past 10 years, like the com competitiveness level has changed a lot. Like we were talking to Anam Ahmed earlier in the week, and he was just talking about how like, he feels like it's almost more competitive over here now than it is over in Europe. Like, did you feel yeah. like, you know, racing um, over in Europe and Australia, like in racing over here, like, do you, do you feel like it's just more competitive over here or about the same? It's, uh, it's very, very, very competitive here. Um, I, I honestly, for me, it's felt 
very similar everywhere I go. Because mm-hmm. um, it doesn't matter really where you are. There's always that top five group that's just really, really quick. And there's like nothing in between you wherever <laughs> you go. Um, and then there's the guys like who are a bit slower behind you guys. And then it continues down. Um, fine, over here it's very close. It's like, especially you look at, say, IndyCar. I yeah. mean, it's the top 20 that are like nothing in between. So, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, the higher up you go, it just, the, the more people in that group gets bigger and bigger. But, uh, this is definitely, I'd say it's almost, I would agree with that, um, and say this is almost more competitive than Europe. Um, just cause in Europe, a lot of the time you have maybe like five drivers who, who've got sponsors and who are really quite good. And then you got a lot of guys who are only there really because their family can afford it. Um, and they're taking up the seats, but they're not quite as good. So we're here, obviously it being a little bit cheaper and everything. I think there's just more talent, more talent pool here. Well, I mean, I think you can only look back a couple of weeks and, you know, Connor Daly, who yeah. by all accounts was going to be, with Ed Carpenter racing for the, for probably his career is now gone. And, you know, end of the day, I mean, it could have been differences of personalities or whatever, but no, they weren't winning. They're not running up front. People obviously weren't happy and changes are going to get made one way or another. And uh, that's where the sports kind of gotten back to. Whereas like, you know, you better perform yeah. or you're going to be gone. Now, for you, Kyle, kind of being a product of the Road to Indy series, like, you know, talk, and I don't know, it is, obviously it has changed this past year as far as what you get for winning the <laughs> series. A little bit of controversy there. But um, when you, I don't, like, what what was the package deal back when you won it? Winning the championship, yeah. like prize money, it was a million dollars. Right. So just flat million dollars. I wish you could cash it. They wouldn't let me. <laughs> <laughs> I had to I had to take that did, straight to a team. And, did you tell them about your spreadsheets and and all Man, that. How, knew, how you know how to make money? If they knew, I'd probably turn that million into five million and run a full season. But uh, yeah, go. now now I work in investing, so I, I think I probably could do a lot more with a million dollars in uh in, in my bank account than I could giving it to an IndyCar team. But <laughs> regardless, uh, it was a million dollars that you could give to a team and whatever you could turn that into. And so of course, the first thing a lot of drivers did, I, I don't know today with the you know smaller prize money, I'm sure it's a similar process. But you you shop that out, you take it to the teams and say. What, what, what can I get for this million dollars, basically? And some teams will say, we'll run you a really good Indy 500 program. All right, that's pretty good. Shop to another team. Uh, we can give you, a, they're not going to say this, but, you know, subpar Indy 500 program and then a couple other races involved. And, and at the end of the day, when we went to Ricardo, who's the team I've been running with for many years, a lot of trust, uh, I knew they were in my corner. I know they would go out and look for sponsors for me, which you couldn't say about any other program and any other team. They could run me in four races in my first year, including the 500. Plus, they were out constantly looking for a full-time sponsor to run me. So in that in that decision at that point in time, there weren't a lot of available seats. So it was really there, Harding or Coin. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the way I was kind of making that decision was I could run with Harding and Coin, and they'll, they'll take my money, and then they'll run me for a couple of races. And then, all right, see ya, where's, the, where's more money? Versus running four races with a team who, yeah, probably is going to be a new program and take some time to ramp up, but we're still out there fighting to do a full season. So from that point of view, it made a lot of sense at the time. Looking back, would I change anything? It's hard to say. It's it's tough to say because now I'm obviously out of a seat and I could look back and say, like, man, I wonder what would have happened if I did jump into Harding and they put together a great program that year. Or, you know, at the time, Gabby was running and it wasn't crazy special, but might have been better than Ricardo's seat. So it's hard to say looking back, but... I don't think I made the worst decision in that situation. Yeah, I mean it's such a tough call, right? I mean, I mean, none of us know anything until it's over. I mean, then we, then we, once we have all the information, it's easy to make decisions, right? Yeah, and I, I definitely spent time looking back and saying, you know, if I went back, would I have made a different decision? And if I did make that different decision, would it have been a better outcome? And to be honest, it, it's not cut and dry. I can't say mm-hmm. definitively, like, oh yeah, if I had just gone to the coin seat, I would have won the 500 like it's it's not that cut and dry it's just you know it's tough and and it's it is a little luck dependent it's a little time dependent you look at some of the lights champions before me you know sage Karam got a full full ride at ganassi for for a year over a year so i think the key and and this is i guess my 
advice to Lockie, <laughs> you know, for when you win the Indy, Indy Next Championship and you're sitting in these in this position, is any time you could get more races under your belt and try to convert that into a full season, that's going to be to your benefit. I think just experience is the big thing and finding a program that you can you can build behind you, like thinking about just getting that those reps in. I think that's the most important thing for the rookies. The more races you get under your belt, the more time you have to prove what you're capable of. If you just do one race or two races, that nobody's going to be really impressed, no matter what you do. It's just one race, unless you win it, yeah. which is pretty darn tough, as you were saying, in IndyCar. So more reps, full season, shoot for that if you can. I mean, at one point, wasn't it like you got guaranteed like Indy 500, right? That obviously wasn't when you, but I think at some point, didn't they, Scott? They had it where if you won the championship, well, you were like guaranteed. I, the money covered, you could run the speedway. Yeah. And then, like you said, you may be able to stretch into some other things. But wasn't there some kickers from, like, Honda or one of them as well? I didn't get that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure, like, you know, depending on the team you work with, I'm sure they have some deals and other things that you could work out. Um, I just don't think there were a lot of seats available the year I won it at the end of the day, right? right. There was, it, I guess, seller's market in that situation, what, right? What was, the, what was IndyCar field size? 22 cars? Mm. Yeah, I mean, full time it was probably around twenty two. It yeah. definitely wasn't as big as it is today. I mean, today's like unprecedented. I think, yeah. yeah, so it was probably it was probably around that twenty to twenty two. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's hard. I mean, five doesn't sound like a lot, but five's a lot. It, it really is. I mean, those now now teams are just adding more cars, right? It, it, back then, it was you felt like there wasn't a seat available with twenty two. So yeah. it's crazy how much they've grown the grid. Right. There's a lot of money coming over from Europe. That's that's the yeah. other big thing, right? I think people are looking kind of to the West and saying, all right, well, that's better racing, a lot more affordable. Why would I not take my money there and get way more bang for your buck and also a chance to win and make a name for yourself? Yeah, well, you have guys who are racing Formula 2 who are spending a couple million a year racing F2 who aren't going to go to F1. And they're like, why am I spending this money here when I could be spending it racing IndyCar? So we're having more fun. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what McLaren did, right, in a way. And it, I forget what the fraction is, but obviously it's a lot smaller than than running an F1 team. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it, you know, it's such a weird game. Like, because, you know, for, I feel like for 15 years, we've all said, man, IndyCar's ready to take off. And then it just kind of stays where it's at. But it, it does feel like there's more eyes on it. Um, and the, the funny part is, is, the weird part is, is that the competitors seem really happy with the product, which is very rare in auto racing. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. But, um, you know, all the drivers and teams and the people kind of watching, they all say the same things. They say, I, I think it's the best sport, yeah. the best racing in the world. Mm-hmm. I think it's we, we get to run all these di- different disciplines. Um, everybody's, you know, you know, most of the grids within three quarters of a second less really but yeah just needs um, to be marketed a bit better it, yeah, yeah just there's this weird marketing thing that you know the speed it's almost like the 500 so big it sucks the air out of the room for everything else yeah um it, i don't know if that's accurate or not but that's the way it feels i think it's a really interesting dynamic that in, or an interesting problem indycar has to face because you're right like if you ask most people who are casual fans about IndyCar, they think the Indy 500 is the only race that exists on the schedule. Mm-hmm. And when you tell them that, no, there's like a 18, I don't even know how many races there are now, but 18 race schedule, they're like, what? It's not just the Indy 500? And that's something I experienced growing up in California where there really isn't a big fan base. There definitely is a big fan base, but at least where I was growing up, a lot of people weren't growing up as race fans. They didn't know that. Right. And I think today, and Lockie and I were talking about this before coming here, if you just picked up IndyCar and took it exactly as it is and replaced it with F1, like just pick up those cars and put them on the F1 schedule, it'd be the, it, would, it would blow F1 out of the water, right? If it was the same product, same branding, and you just did what they're doing with the same cars, blow it out of the water. The racing's the best in the world, no question. It's just the branding and the marketing. Yeah, it, it's a really interesting thing, too, because they do things try to reach out to, quote, unquote, younger generations. And um, like we were talking to somebody who runs Indy Next, and at Michigan, at Detroit, they had uh, concerts, and they had absolutely no cross promotion. Yeah. They had these concerts near the venue, near the track, no cross promotion, no, um, you know, and they, you know, they should have Indy Next drivers there. They should have had some of the younger, 
IndyCar drivers there, and they weren't. And it's just like all these missed opportunities. Um, it, you know, it's, it, it's almost like the teams and drivers are all kind of left to do their own promotion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's why you got somebody like Pato Award who is brilliant at self promotion. Yeah. Um, and Nam yeah. is really good at self promotion. Well, you, you look at like Iowa last year. Um, I wasn't there, but from what I saw on TV, it looked massive because they had big artists there singing there, Gwen Stefani and yeah. a couple of other, I can't remember who was singing there, but it just like, a lot of people were like, went there almost for the concert. Yeah, um, oh, absolutely. And it's like, we might as well go watch an, I had never seen an IndyCar race before, let's go do that as well and then see the well, concert in the afternoon. I think they do like, don't they do like a couple concerts before the race and then a couple after? Yeah, so I think they did. It actually, kind of forces yeah. people That's to what stay. they did last year. I, I don't know what the schedule is like for this year. Yeah. A big machine. I think I think those well, are this year's like Ed Sheeran, like they're going big this year. Yeah. Well okay. that's one thing back home with the V eight supercars they used to always do at big street circuits. They would have um like one year at Eclipse Hall five hundred in Adelaide they had the Red Hot Chili Peppers playing. And I'd never seen the race as packed as it was. It was insane because everyone was just there to see them really. Uh -huh. Um but then they're like, Oh yeah, let's watch the V eights as well like and it's just, they just have a good time, like, just a good event. Yeah, I mean, you know, Speedway, on race day, there's probably 40,000 people never watch a car on track because they're over at the... <laughs> probably more than that. Well, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the ones who specifically go to the, uh, the the concert. Snake Pit. Snake Pit, yeah. You didn't go to Snake Pit? Oddly enough, I did not. I, I, I mean, I, I really thought about it. His Snake Pit days are long gone. <laughs> I you thought about it. I had like real short denim shorts and boots, and I thought I was really going to do it. And then... you see, way before your time, Lockie, the the snake pit was a lot crazier. No, I, I mean, way before my time too. Yeah, yeah. It, it, there, it, Scott it, can tell you some stories. <laughs> I, well, I mean, it's not like I hung out there, but you know, Billy and I actually spent some time '86 <laughs> over by there when it got rained down, and we sit there drinking all day. So. uh but there's no real good stories from that, but we did sit there drinking all no, day. No, no good stories that you can remember. Well, I mean, the real snake pit days, I was a kid. so. <laughs> but I, I would go down there. Doesn't you know, mean you didn't participate. I would go down there and I'd watch. I, was, uh, I, would, I, would, uh, I would definitely take it in. That's actually one thing I did this year at the 500 was actually just watching the people leaving the snake pit at the end of the day. It's actually just people watching. Oh, it's, it's awesome. Insane. Yeah, it's like as we're leaving... You just got all these people straggling out. Yeah. And it's, you're like, there's no way some of these people are finding their way home. No, <laughs> no way. You see some weird things. So this year I saw that and then I saw Tom Sneva stuck like in the middle of it in his car. Like he's like trying to turn around. There's like all of these like people from the snake pit trying to get out. <laughs> Which is like the most Tom Sneva thing ever. Like if you knew Tom, it, it'd be stuck in that. That's about right. <laughs> but no, we've, I mean, we've had people on our show who, like um, racers have told us stories about the snake pit. Like Roberto Guerrero was saying, like after the race, he remembers looking into the snake pit, and, like there was mattresses on fire and stuff. <laughs> so a lot of crazier stuff. Yeah. Couches. Couches on Couches fire. Couches on yeah. fire. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Willie T. Ribs tells us a yeah. funny story that Alan Jr. told him, and we we confirmed with Al it was not true. But he said that um, Al told him. I think it was just he just made 500 one year, right? Willie did. Yeah. Yeah. Told him that. Hey, like in the beginning of the race, if you look over into the snake pit, he goes, girls will flash you. <laughs> <laughs> and he said he believed him and he had his um, seatbelt undone. And oh he was like gosh. looking up. Man, the Speedway was a wilder time at one time, even in the 80s. You, you do see that at Bathurst back home. Um, for Bathurst 1000, you'll see the, t the camera will just be like panning from like the track and into the fans and you occasionally see probably when Lockie drives by yeah for well sure. well th yeah definitely yeah, mid ohio this weekend <laughs> yeah. keep your eyes peeled <laughs> well aaron be aaron you'll, you'll flash him won't you oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's why um jagger had a little incident last year because bowie lifted up his shirt <laughs> <laughs> uh, did he have an incident in mid ohio no no it was an indie oh yeah <laughs> That was a little incident. It was, our, it was right in front of us, too. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was right in front of us. I, he needed to be distracted about 10 feet further back, and he'd been all right. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. 
Um, so, you know, talking about the road to Indy, um, Kyle, like, I mean, when you look at it now, so we have USF 2000, Indy Pro 2000. I know they've, like, changed the names. Indy Next and then Indy Car. When you did it, it was basically, the, was it the same series or did one get, because it was Star Mazda, Indy Lights, what was before Star, Ma, Star Mazda? It was, was still it? USF, yeah. It was called yeah. USF 2000. I guess technically there was, now they've added one before USF 2000. They got USF uh, Junior USF or something. Juniors, so yeah. I, I honestly, I, I keep up with USF 2000 because Lockheed's racing in it. And outside of that, I probably don't watch hardly enough. But yeah, when I was in it, it was pretty much a lot of people went to Skip Barber would do the Skip Barber series and then jump into USF, then go to Pro Mazda or Star Mazda, then Indy, Indy Lights, and then Indy Car. So the US, and this may be a question for you, Lockie, so the USF Junior and the USF 2000 and Indy Pro 2000, are they all the same chassis? Uh, yes, they are. The same tub. Um, yeah. They, they brought in the USF Juniors this year because they just wanted something to bridge the gap from go-karts to to USF 2000 or from Skip Barber to USF 2000. So that's why they brought that in. Um, Do they have an age limit now? Like, can you run I think your division if you're under such and such age? I think 15 or 14. Because before they were getting like 13 year olds, 14 year olds. Yeah. Yeah, I think 15 or 14 something is the yeah. age requirement. Something like that. I know, I know uh, for F, if it's like for Europe, for like F4, it's 15, F, anything FIA. Um, but yeah, I don't even know if Indy, does IndyCar have an age requirement? I think it has to be 18, right? I think it's 18. Yeah. I think Stop you have memory. to be 18. Because I know Form, Formula One never had one until that Max Verstappen came in there and, and <laughs> yeah, what was he, 16? He was, uh, yeah. I think he was, he was 17, 17 when he did yeah. his first race. Yeah. So yeah, then they're crazy. like, we have to make an age rule. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When I, when I first jumped in, uh, Skip Barber, I was 13. And when I first jumped into a pro Mazda race, I was 16. So probably about that lower end of the spectrum for getting in but yeah yeah i think even when i was racing colton was very young when he got into a skip barber car too he was probably like 12 <laughs> maybe even maybe even a little younger well, look at the Walden kids yeah the, oliver no sebastian one of them just won a race in skippy yeah wow how old like, is he like 11 yeah something like that <laughs> that's insane well they already have development deals with andretti yeah oh, i believe it yeah that's awesome though i mean i i think that if you know what you're doing your age for racing shouldn't really matter as long as you can reach the pedals and be safe. Right. No, absolutely. You know, talented no, I th kids. I, th I, th I think it's always, um, if you're, if you're fast enough, you're old enough. If you're fast enough, you're young enough, depending on which way of the spectrum you are. If you're racing in your early forties, if you're fast enough, you should still be there. If you're, you know, young and you're fast enough, you should be there. It should just be, yeah. I think age really should, they even looked into it that much to be honest i think it's just what well, you can do behind a car that's how indiana got jeff gordon right he couldn't run in california i think <laughs> when really? that the deal with jeff and then he had to move here and so he's running sprint cars here when he's 13 14 years old yeah you know he's running he's running wing sprint cars you know it look like a i mean look like <laughs> one of the other driver's children you know? yeah. yeah yeah i think that's awesome i think you know if you got the talent and you can hang Go for it. Yeah, I mean, those guys are rare. Yeah. Rare, rare, rare. I mean, him and the Kyle Larsons of the world, they're, that's rare to have it. That kind of wherewithal at that age. But. Yeah, as well as just the opportunity to even get in a car. Right. I mean, who knows how many 11-year-olds or 12-year-olds are out there that could do it, but just never even get a chance. Right. So, I mean, you know, like Lockie said, there's three series, basically, that have the same chassis or same tub. Like, Kyle, do you think that um, – I mean, so you skipped, so you didn't do USF 2000, did you? No, it, it was kind of a timing thing. I spent right. two and a half-ish years. I was jumping back and forth between, like, playing football in high school and racing. And for a period of time, I'm like, yeah, I want to play college football. So I was kind of bouncing back and forth between the two. And it got to a point where I was five foot eight, and I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to be a college <laughs> quarterback. <laughs> like, I need to be real here. But I, I love them both. It wasn't like a matter of, like, I, I don't know which one I love more. I love them both. But realistically, racing was a – true career path and yeah. I, it was something i loved just as much so once that became clear it was a no-brainer so when you look at like you know the three the three difference here we're really four now like do you think that you know some people think that you know it's kind of too repetitive like you know it's just a matter of just a few extra horsepower or whatever like you think there could be one kind of taken away and like combining series together or because we've seen so good friend of the stone jagger jones did usf 2000 last year 
this series doing any next. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I guess my opinion on that would be I don't think you can remove Indy Lights. I already feel like the gap from Indy Lights to Indy Car is pretty big. I can't imagine Mm, removing Indy Lights and being like, oh, yeah, you go from Pro... Indy Pro, what is it, USF Pro? Champion? USF Pro 2000. Yeah, yeah. I, Pro Mazda. I'm just going to stick to what I know. <laughs> yeah, you don't go from Pro Mazda to IndyCar. That's insane. So yeah. I think, like, if you were to cut, combine anything, I think maybe it's USF 2000 to Indy Lights to, to IndyCar, and that's all it is. I, don't, I think the USF Juniors and Pro Mazda is maybe a little redundant. That's my opinion. I mean, I kind of did that. That's basically what I did. I went yeah. Pro Mazda, Indy Lights, IndyCar, and I felt pretty prepared at that point, jumping yeah. into each series. So I think that's probably all you need, mm-hmm. but that's just my opinion. Well, the thing I think it hurts people is if you win USF 2000 championship, um, you get money for Indy Pro 2000. Yeah. In some cases, people would be, you know, ready to move up to. Indy well, unfortunately, the ladder is even more broken than that because they're not even part of the same series. I mean, Indy Next is part of IndyCar. And but do they still get the they still get the money like the same, right? Yeah, it's, it's do the, they? the prize money. Oh, okay. The same. Um, but I think the the best thing about the the ladder system, like going, I'm not counting juniors because I've never done that, but uh, USF 2000, Indy Pro 2000, Indy Lights, um, you just build momentum mm-hmm. when you don't skip them. Um, so if, you, if you're winning them each year, you know, teams, an IndyCar team might already be opening up a seat for you a year in advance because they see you coming sort of thing, where if you're just... I don't know, maybe skip Indy Pro or something, and you jump to lights, um, maybe the timing's not right. You don't have that big momentum behind you. So um, unless you got a big sponsor that can just pay for your drive. Um, but you see the likes of, like, Carl Kirkwood, who just won everything, and um, he was always going to get in the, into an IndyCar seat just because of, you know, winning and the momentum that was behind him. Well, you talk about timing. Uh, you know, Kyle Kirkwood goes to Foyt last year, and I mean, obviously everybody here knows struggled. Mm. But you, if they had the same engineering staff last year, what would have Kyle done there? Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, realistically, it, it could yeah. have been an amazing year. Yeah. Ah, just racing, huh? Yeah. I mean, it really is. It's, sometimes it's just really, truly the, the, the luck of it and the timing of it. Yeah. yeah. He's super quick and super talented, but he had a full year to – Yeah shake off that rookie rust, uh, whatever you want to call it, rookie mistakes, get it out of your system and jump into a really quick Andretti seat and win at Long Beach, right? I mean, right. he's super talented. So that I feel like if I was president for a day of, you know, if I could just maybe wave a magic wand, I think that whoever wins Indy next should get a full season. That should be, that should yeah. be table stakes. I, I, I don't have a problem. I mean, even if you told me half season – I would go along with that. I'm not compromising. <laughs> no, well, I mean, you are, you're, no, so you're I, more I dictator. I, I'm dictator. Day. I'll be dictator for a day and say that. Listen, if you're if you're going to win any next full season right. any car yeah. table stakes, it, and they should have a team set up for that. Like if there's not I, yeah. a team that's going to hire you or a team that's going to take that money, have a low budget team out there that's running cost effective or whatever it takes to just get a full season under your belt because. Yeah. I think that's not only going to be good for the series, it's going to keep some consistency and show what you could do over a full season because three races isn't enough. One race isn't enough. Right. Three races is better, but you need, a, you need a full season under your belt coming out of Indy Lights. Yeah. No, I, and yeah, I, nobody's I gonna don't think that's a bad that, idea. But, yeah. Yeah. but that, honest, honestly, that should be table stakes, and that's what it is going up the whole ladder system. You know, The scholarship money, theoretically, gets you a full season at the next level. So I don't know why, once you make it to the top and win – Right before IndyCar, it's like, okay, three races, good luck. Yeah. It just it just seems stupid, in my opinion. And that also causes mistakes from the rookies because it's like, I've got three races to show everyone what I got. Right. Yeah, yeah. so, I mean, <laughs> Roger, if you're listening, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know. Well, he tunes in quite often. A lot of people don't know that. <laughs> well, good. I mean, I, I think that I – know, I know it's one thing to say it, right? It's just money, right? It's yeah, what right. – what is it? I mean, obviously, somebody's got to pay for it. So, I know it's more complicated than that, but – I think that if we're going to do it properly, do it properly. I think it's a really interesting idea. I, I do. I, I, you know, it's a. I think that is really interesting. And like what you, kind of talent do you think that's going to draw here? Right. In the Indy next series, if you said, well, okay, you win the championship, full season Indy car next year, guaranteed. Win the championship, full season with Penske for a year. <laughs> Gosh, yeah. I mean, that'd be great. But I, I you drive. know, I'm trying to be realistic with my dictatorship theory. You know, I'm not going to say you get you get the fourth seat at Penske, but seriously, I think. 
you'd get some insane talent that comes over mm -hmm. jumping in Indy next, and I think it would make awesome racing. It'd be it'd probably be the most sought after series, like yeah. not not main series, but well, I mean, I think you could al you know already say that that uh, the ladder system as it was is what's made. I mean, you know, of course, HMD <laughs> skews the curve a little bit with all their cars, but they've got twenty. 17 to 20 cars at each race. Yeah. Whereas, you know, they had eight, nine, ago, yeah. a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I know for a fact that's why Jones came over is because he thought for less money than when he was going to get a chance to do and run ARCA, mm -hmm. you know, and go get crashed every week in ARCA, um, he could do, you know, US, USF Pro and, or whatever it was yeah. last year and, and uh, he parlayed that into his Indy Next deal for this year. So, yeah, I mean, for the money, you know, it's the better option. I mean, that stock car deal is ridiculous. It, it was a million dollars plus crash <laughs> for ARCA. Yeah, crazy. There's going to be a lot of crash. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of crash in ARCA. Um, so I, I just can't imagine anybody, unless you got a – Sponsors want to take you through this path who'd ever volunteer for that, but they do. Yeah, I think you know, part of the issue with the road indie was you know, look at someone like Howard Kirkwood. You know, the money he got, the only ride he could afford last year was with Foyt, obviously, not the best equipment. Um, and you know, people are like, oh, he crashed a lot. I don't think he's that good of a driver, but he was probably overdriving the car. Like, is that something, Kyle, that you saw like if you were in a car that was you know, that was lacking? Mechanically or whatever, like you were almost like trying to overdrive, like trying to overcompensate. Yeah, yeah, and and he he always knew he, he was going to have that in, uh, Andretti seat for this year as well. Mm -hmm. So um, there was just some stuff that went on behind the scenes. I think why he didn't get the drive uh, right. in twenty two, but um, yeah, I think he always had that freedom that he was going to have the Andretti seat this year. So he was just like balls to the wall every race. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that, you know, to answer your question, if you feel like your equipment isn't up to snuff and it's not allowing you to show what you can do and you have nothing to lose, you know, as yeah. you said, Lockie, why not? Why not push overdrive? Sure. I think in my situation, four races, new team, equipment's not there. There was a lot of, you know, I, I crashed at Long Beach in qualifying, pushing way too hard, trying to put in a quick time. So, of course, you're a rookie. You're learning how to drive the red tires. You get almost no practice on the reds all weekend. And then your first time really running them is qualifying. You get one run. Good luck. <laughs> it's just, it's, and it's so competitive, right? You know you need to push to your absolute limit of whatever you got to even have a chance to advance to the next qualifying round. So I think, I think that is just inherent with IndyCar. You have to push way harder than you're comfortable pushing to even be competitive. Right. I mean, you look at someone like Alex Pelot. Obviously, he didn't really. I mean, I don't. I think that announcement really shocked a lot of people. Like, what is Chip doing? Like, and obviously, he saw something. I mean, now the guys, people say he's like top three drivers in the world or something because he's talking to F1 teams like they're trying to get him F1 right for next year. Yeah, well, I, that's why he made the McLaren deal. I think is because I don't know a chance at going to Formula One, but I think he's. Uh, I made a stupid decision leaving a Ganassi car. I mean, what he's doing at the moment in that car and that team, I mean, it's the best car in the field. Mm -hmm. um, I, mean, I mean, he could stay there for the next, for the foreseeable future and win multiple championships, Indy 500s. Um, not saying he won't do that at McLaren, but... Well, now I think he's being – so I think with this contract with McLaren, apparently there's some kind of clause that if he finds a F1 ride before, like, the end of July, he can get out of the McLaren deal. So I think that's what they're trying to do now. And he's been linked, I think, to, like, the Alpha Tori ride. But like you said, like, he's not going to win races in an Alpha Tori car. No. So no. why just stay over America and, you know, yeah, possibly exactly. win a 500 or two, win IndyCar championships? Well, then he's got a path to Red Bull. <laughs> I mean, that's true. Yeah. I mean, you, you can never – I mean, the Formula One, the prestige of Formula One is always going to allure every single driver. Um, Especially a Spaniard. Yeah, <laughs> right? he's, exactly. not, he's not an American exactly. driver. Not, no offense to that, but uh, yeah. yeah, you come from Europe. Sure. F1 is what you grow up right. knowing and loving. So you can't, can't knock him for looking back that way when yeah. he's dominating out here. Yeah. And uh, oh, we've seen people do it in the past as well. You've seen, uh, you know, Jack Villeneuve did it. 
uh, Montoya did it. Uh, they were both successful. And obviously, guys like Mario was going back and forward in F1. Um, so yeah, you never know if you if you can get successful at it. It's pretty cool. I mean, Alonso did it. He was able to do both. So yeah. barely. Now, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> now, do you ever just let those F1 teams know? Do you ever just send them emails and that and just say, "Hey, Alonso's running pretty good, but I did knock him out of the 500." Yeah, I'm five years out of racing. Call me up. <laughs> well, I'm fresh. I'm ready to go. Yet. Yeah, yeah. I do. I do run an F1 fantasy league, and that might be my team name. <laughs> <laughs> so, a um, couple things. So, first off, Kyle, you were telling us when we were doing the go kart thing. You were telling us a story about how you like came up with this spreadsheet. Um, it was for Formula <laughs> One, and that's kind of like how you got your job now. Yeah, it, it is kind of a funny story. So, uh, after COVID hit, that's what kind of derailed my racing career. Unfortunately, I'm. It affected a lot of people in a lot of different ways. So we had a sponsor lined up for the 2020 season. COVID hits, you know, before St. Pete, and that just evaporated. So kind of left high and dry wondering what to do. Fortunately, I'd been going to college for the last four years, five years before that, kind of intermittently just to be able to push forward my degree. And I've been studying finance. So I was like, yeah, let's uh, – now, now remote classes are common. After that happened, everybody shifted to remote class. So I'm like, I could finish my degree, live in India, and just – you know, finish everything. So I, I went ahead and pushed that forward. And uh, then I'm like, all right, well, I, I should probably get a job. I need to pay my bills and get things moving. So for fun, I was watching F1 and racing. And I just had an affinity for spreadsheets because it'd been what I'd been studying in my degree for finance. So I put together a predictive analysis of where cars would qualify for qualifying. I got based on their practice times, I created an algorithm in Excel that I could predict within a couple hundreds of a second where their time would be in qualifying. Of course, I gambled a little bit, made a little money on the side, like betting on who would beat their teammate in certain races or when a, you know, at the time, George Russell and Williams would make it into Q3. I predicted that to a T that weekend in Silverstone. So there were some fun times that this little spreadsheet was spinning out. So when I was applying for jobs, they're like, oh, what experience do you have in Excel and, you know, predictive analysis? I'm like, well, do I have something to show you? <laughs> and I, I pulled that out and they were just like, oh, can you do this for our, for our firm? I'm like, yeah, sure. So uh, that's what I'm doing now. I'm, I'm working data analysis at a firm here in Indy. Yeah. So kind of a different, you know, I like to joke around and be like, um, you know, after I tell stories about racing, I'm like, wait till I tell you about my spreadsheets I'm working on. <laughs> so definitely not as exciting as racing a, an Indy car, but uh, I, li I like what I'm doing now. I uh, wouldn't, wouldn't pass on an opportunity to get back into the 500 for sure. That's still on my mind and something I'm still pushing for potentially, but I think, uh, I think I'm in a pretty good spot right now professionally. So that's something. So let me ask you this. If you could do guaranteed two years, full season, but you had to quit your job. And hey, you someone to... from his job may be here, so you need to be careful. <laughs> well, I'm just saying. I'm just kidding. No, I think I'd be stupid to say no, right? I mean, okay. uh, realistically, as a driver, if you're given well, two years. because people, I, hit, what team, people are at different parts. At what team, right? Am, right. I getting, am I getting tossed yeah. like a scrap team where I'm running at the back? I mean, that doesn't interest me to derail my professional career, but it's true. It's true, but. In this hypothetical situation, somebody that's coming to me, offering me two years, and I've been five years out. I, I, yeah, I'll run the analysis. I'll plug it into my spreadsheet and see how quick they'll be. But, yeah, no, if Ganassi or Penske come to you and say, you know, in this, in this hypothetical situation, you get two years, show me what you can do. Yeah, I'd do it. Right. But who wouldn't, right? Like, right. I, mean, it was, I think I'd, I'd be quick, so why not, why not prove it? Right. It's, it's just so interesting because you reach a certain point. Uh, everybody reaches certain points in their lives where – the juice isn't worth the squeeze, right? And I, I'm just was seeing if that's, you know, like you want to run the 500, but does it, you know. I want to win races, right? Like right. That, you, you can't, you, okay. can, you can take the driver out of the car, but you can't take, oh, wait. Well, I, I was trying to do something <laughs> clever there. Yeah, well, you know what I'm trying to say. But you still want to be a driver. I want to win races, right? You can't take the competitive nature out of me right. to want to win races. So right. at the end of the day, if somebody gives me an opportunity to race at a top team in the best series with the best racing for two years, all right, no brainer. Yeah, yeah. I think now, it, I think it's easy. Lockie, let me ask you this: You're you're winning races right now. You know he was a winner. Uh, you've kind of seen how his career went. Uh, he did run the 500 twice. Um, he never got probably never got the opportunities he deserved. Um, and you see that? Does that ever put anything in the back of your mind? Like, hey man, maybe I'll prepare for something else as well, just in case. 
No, because I think I'll just have to win more races than what Kyle did. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. But um, <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, just racing in general. It's, it's, it's Kyle's not the only one that's happened to. Sure. Um, Unfortunately, it's, it's happened it's, to a lot of people. Yeah, it's a sport we all love and hate. Um, yeah, we were talking about Gabby Chavez, and we've had him up here. And every once in a while, I see his oil change vans <laughs> driving down the road. And I'm, I'm telling you, man, that that day I saw it was pole day. And he was, and you know, I saw his oil change van driving down the road with him driving it. The year after he'd already been in the race, I thought, man, that that's got to be hard. I mean, because he was driving by the speedway, mm -hmm. and uh, and I I had so I've used his oil change company. I, you know, that is so tough because you you know you want to stay in the in the circus as long as you can. And it's just so hard when when you're not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Racing. I, yeah. I can speak to it. That's the way it's been for a long time. Right. It's an expensive sport. There's really nothing to compare it to. There's no other sport like it in the world. And just a few weeks ago, I was, I was visiting Spencer out in Florida, and we were just kind of reminiscing, right? We're both out of it now, you could say. And we're just looking back. And if we had won the Heisman in football, in college football, we'd be a top draft pick, three-year contract, make millions of dollars. It's no-brainer, right? Those people just make right. a killing. So, unfortunately – if racing was like that, we'd have a three-year contract. You know, it, it's right. just it's it's unfortunate that that's not conducive to the way racing is, or the way it's built, yeah. or the business in racing, which is a whole animal in and of itself. Yeah, it's hard. It, it, I, I've, I don't know how many people I've told this to. I said, auto racing, being in the sport at any level, will most likely be one of the hardest things you'll ever do in your life, outside of raising kids. I'm sure, not that I've ever raised kids, but <laughs> you know. Um, I mean, it's just, I mean, the, the wear and tear and the ups and downs and it's a, it's hard, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just the nerves as well. Cause it's not all in your control. Right. Yeah. There's, uh, so many variables in racing. So, yeah. I mean, you know, if somebody else makes a mistake, you're having to drive of your life. <laughs> somebody else makes a mistake, mm -hmm. you know, nothing you can do. It's, it just really is, uh. I mean, it's crazy. You know, I, I was out in uh, Torrance uh, or Rolling Hills, California, talking to Parnelli about four years ago. And to this day, losing the 67-500, even though he won in 63, losing the 67 when he led all those laps, and it was, you know, just a $3 bearing. I'm telling you, it has haunted that man. His entire his entire life since. I mean, he's had an amazing life. I'm not saying it's affected his life, but it, I mean, you sit there and listen to it, how it, it still bothers him to this day. It's unbelievable how much this sport, especially for the great ones, it just gets inside of you. Mm -hmm. You yeah. have to give it so much to make it. Yeah. Right. I mean, well, I mean, he, he, he when he decided to have kids, he quit running open wheel race cars. Yeah. And that was the day he quit. Mm hmm. Yeah, you dedicate your life to achieving something, and then it's taken away. And sometimes it's your choice, sometimes it's not. That's that's hard. That's right. When anything gets ripped away from you that you dedicate your life to or spend so much time, it's yeah, it's really tough to, to move on from that. I agree. Now, kind of wrapping up, there was one last thing, Kyle, that you said I needed to ask Lockie about. <laughs> I don't know if there's anything behind this question, so I have no idea. But <laughs> I, I heard you're a big fan of spiders. <laughs> <laughs> no, so – Kyle always likes to throw this around. Um, he's an idiot. Um, <laughs> we we have a there's a Australian saying back home, um, which I first said to Kyle when I moved here. I can't remember what we're talking about, but this the saying goes. I won't say the full saying, but I'm not here to f spiders. Um, I don't know what I'm allowed to say here. Um, it's a weird <laughs> saying. Yeah. Yeah. I. I yeah, I bet you can get that word. Um, and uh, it basically means I'm not here to muck around. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not here to F spiders. I'm not, I'm not here to muck around. So it's a very Australian saying that we say. Um, and I said that to Carl once. I can't remember why or what we're doing. We're playing ping pong, I think. Uh, I mean, we're, might have been playing we're playing ping pong, ping -pong, ping -pong and, like and he had a good shot. And he's like, well, I'm not here to F spiders. I'm like, 
the heck does that mean? Yeah. What are you talking about <laughs> yeah. spiders right now? Yeah. Yeah. And so now every race he wins, I post a little spider in his caption. Yeah. So, oh, I like uh, it. Uh, no spiders yeah. in that well, vicinity. Well, th that is how I am whenever I do anything. So when I'm racing, yeah, I'm not there to... So is that why <laughs> is that why you guys don't race a barber because they have those big spiders on the track? Yeah, yeah. yeah, that could be that could be why. Keep them away from Lawson. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, don't let me within. <laughs> yeah, that was the joke though. I ha I had to bring it up at least once, getting him in front of a, a microphone. Yeah, well, but, that's pretty good. I've never heard that. One. You need to get yeah. some T-shirts made with spiders but on. No, it. Well, yeah. you need to know somebody can get some T-shirts made. Yeah, yeah. You, you talk to anyone who's grown up in Australia. They'll tell you about that saying. So, so Will Power would tell us the same oh, thing. Oh, Will Power would do it. He would definitely. I'm surprised he hasn't said it on any interview. He says everything <laughs> he else. He says, yeah, I know. Like <laughs> it his, does everything his else. Interview, his interview after his crash with Scott Dixon last last weekend was quite entertaining. <laughs> so it's like the middle finger. Like it, he does it a lot. Obviously, you do, do your little lot. wave at fast times. <laughs> Is that like a big Australian <laughs> thing or something? It might be. Uh, I think we're just very relaxed and just like. Yeah. Um, I mean. We don't really take stuff too personally, so um, I know maybe that's why he loves to throw it around, but um, I know it's funny, that's for sure. Now, with him being Australian and Scott being Kiwi, do you think that that added to the frustration? <laughs> no, it makes it funnier. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think, I think they probably get along, I would say, Oh. probably best in the field i mean they've both been there for such a long time yeah they were joking around a lot yeah. on sunday after yeah and i mean the thing is as well with them uh and will i've seen it with happen with will with a few drivers is like he just gets very heated in the moment and then he's like yeah he's got a quick switch man. yeah and then he's got a, he's like he's no hard feelings it's just you know one of those things <laughs> Yeah, I, and I yeah I I can't blame for being bad at Dixon uh, over I, that I, man. I, That's yeah. unbelievable. I mean, I mean you're I mean in no way would you ever think that you were going to be passing Scott Dixon. And he's just going to pull yeah. out in front of you. Yeah, yeah, no. I I think Will's reaction was pretty fair. <laughs> it was fairly tempered. It was it was yeah. uh, he held in, held in a lot more emotion. I think a lot of it other people would. It would have been cool if it went full NASCAR style and they were like <laughs> throwing fists and everything. <laughs> that would have been entertaining. <laughs> I have kind of a funny story about Will. Um, when when I was running the – right after COVID, we did that uh, iRacing League. And so we were running lots of laps together with the IndyCar guys during practices and whatnot. And uh, you're all in the same group, so you could hear each other. You could jump on the mic and talk to other drivers, which in IndyCar, in a real race, you can't do that. So iRacing is kind of funny in that way where if somebody makes you mad, you could just yell at them right then and there while you're racing. And I will say of all the drivers, Will was cussing you out. <laughs> Almost every lap. If you get in his way or you do anything to mess up his lap, he's like, you wanker, what do you do? You just, <laughs> yeah. like, hear him, and you're like, oh, my gosh. What, what? You're just not used to that when you're racing. So that was pretty funny to hear Will very frequently getting mad at people during a practice session. That's funny. Yeah. yeah. Might be the, an Austra the Australian in him. Yeah, but I'm sure he does that in the real race car, too. So yeah. I felt like you were behind the scenes kind of hearing Will's thoughts. And I'm sure if he could do that in a real race, he would be all over the button, just <laughs> screaming at everybody. <laughs> Well, um, I, do you have anything else, Scott? Hey, I don't. I just want to thank these guys for showing up. Absolutely. And thank everybody that showed up. And even if you didn't show up for us and you stayed, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you all for coming out. This is super fun. So thanks for being yeah, here. Yeah, I mean, thank you. you know, Kyle, I mean, we've joked around a lot. That moment had to be unbelievable. And Lockie. What moment? <laughs> just just any moment in his life. I I don't know what that spreadsheet that spreadsheet moment. Yeah, that's a big moment that spreadsheet that I made. No, I, I it was really special and, and a moment I'll never forget and you know it's it's fun talking to people who remember that moment, right? Everybody had their place they were at and when that moment happened, I've had a lot of a lot of people come up to me and be like, Oh, remember I remember exactly where I was and what I was doing when you bumped Alonzo, which it's just cool. I mean to it's unbelievable. That. It's yeah. cool to share in that feeling and that it had such a big impact on people who love to watch the sport. I've been a sports fan for my whole life, and seeing underdog moments, it just means something. So to, right. to have one of those big moments is very special. Yeah, I mean, it, it really was, I mean, it really is one of the great stories of the Speedway. And, um, man, best wishes to you for the rest of the year, man. I, I just – Thank you. I hope there's – when we're done, we're talking eight or ten or twelve or how many races <laughs> you can win here on out, man, because uh, it's tough. And uh, once you get on a roll, like you said, you got to stay on a roll. Yeah, and, yeah uh, that's the plan. I hope you make it and hope you get there.
Well, we're not here to play with spiders. So. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Thanks a lot, yeah, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks.